Greetings, everybody. Um, Julie Wiskirken from the Authors Team in Santa Monica. And today I'm excited to welcome Seth Graham Smith for a live, or maybe we should say undead, talk. He, Seth is a film and television writer and producer and an author. He's written four books, including How to Survive a Horror Movie, All the Skills to Dodge the Kills, and the Spider-Man Handbook, The Ultimate Training Manual. And today he's gonna to talk about his latest, which is an inspired literary mashup called Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. And it's currently number five on the New York Times bestseller list. So please join me in welcoming Seth. Hello, Google. How's everybody doing? Thanks for coming and eating your lunch in here. And thanks for being on the video conference, people elsewhere. This is kind of weird, but kind of cool. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to talk for just a minute, but I like to sort of interact more and not just blabber on. And if you guys have questions, that would be hugely helpful, whether there are questions here in the room or elsewhere in there. Um, so think of some questions and let me off the hook, because um, uh, I'm going to run out of things to say very quickly. I guess I'll start by answering the question that everybody opens with, which is why. Um, where did this idea come from? Why did you think to do it? I actually owe the inspiration for this to uh, my editor, Jason Rakulak at Quark Books, who had been wanting, we had done four books previously, these nonfiction humor books, like, uh, like Julie said, um, uh, How to Survive a Horror Movie, Spider-Man Handbook, The Big Book of Porn, a penetrating look at the world of dirty movies. Um, and, uh, and we'd sort of developed a, uh, you know, a, a little unspoken, you know, uh, vibe, a little, little friendship over the phone. And, and to this day, actually, after five books together, we've never met in person, because he's in Philly and I'm in LA, which is weird, but, um, but the digital age. So, uh, so one day, Jason called me up very excitedly and said, uh, Okay, okay, all I have is this title, all right? I can't stop thinking about this title. And to back up, he had been trying to do these mashups or, or, or remix. He had the idea to do like a literary remix of some kind for a long time. And he had these lists, and on one side of the list would be things like Wuthering Heights, things like uh, War and Peace, Tom Sawyer, and on the other side of the list would be things like monkeys and, you know, uh, robots and pirates and all this, you know, and vampires or whatever. And he'd been wanting to find a way to like make, I call it the chocolate peanut butter moment, you know, like, you know, the, where, where something synergistic has to happen here. And he'd been trying and he called me up one day and he said, uh, 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 pride, prejudice, uh, zombies. He said, all, all I got is this, these three words, pride, prejudice, zombies, and I can't stop thinking about it. And what do you think? And right then and there at that moment, I literally started laughing and I said, I think, I think we're done. I think that's the most brilliant thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and I meant it. I know it's weird, but I, I actually meant it. And because as soon as he said Pride, Prejudice, Zombies, my head flooded with images of, you know, uh, Regency era aristocrats running for their lives, you know, and uh, the Bennett sisters flying around like they were in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know why. It just seemed like Kung Fu was like the way to go. I, I, I pictured like Jane Austen meets the Matrix or something, and that was... That, that's, that's where I started. Um, that day, I was so excited and so unemployed that I, I ran out and I picked up a, a copy of the original book, which I had not read since I was 14 years old, a freshman in high school, and I hated it when I was a 14-year-old. I mean, I was too stupid and too much like of a boy to really appreciate you know, what the book was. And, um, and well, I didn't hate it, but it was a chore, you know. I realized, okay, it's great, it's wonderful, you know, I appreciate how great it is, but I was 14 and not really into it. Um, when I reread it almost 20 years later for this, I read it that day, and it's like the light bulb went off. I got it. You know, I said, oh, I get it. Jane Austen's really funny, and she's really witty, and she's really sarcastic, and she draws these incredible characters, and she has a talent for eviscerating the people that she lived with back in the Regency you know, era. And so um, with that in mind, it was like, well, now it seems like an even better idea to add this ridiculous backdrop for all these things to take place again. So what I did after that was, I mean, we didn't even have, 
There was no plan to do this book whatsoever at the publisher. It was just Jason and I thinking this is a great idea. And I started writing up a proposal. At the same time, I read and reread and re-reread the original book, um, very methodically making notes in every page, you know, drawing up ideas and thinking, all right, well, how is this actually going to work? How do you add uh, uh, an ultra-violent zombie apocalypse backdrop to one of the most celebrated you know, novels in the English language? You know, and, and, and not, well, how do you pull it off? I mean, I was about to say and not completely ruin it, but then a lot of people would say, well, you did. But uh, we'll get to that later. Um, so, so yeah, if you change something in chapter three, how does it resonate in chapter 43? And if you change someone's fate here, and, you know, and where can I add these bits of zombie action evenly spaced throughout the book so that you know, it sort of keeps people engaged? So, uh, so that's what I did. And I, I drew up all my logistical plans. I wrote a sample chapter. And, uh, and the publisher was very reluctant still, even after all that, because they didn't get it. You know, they just they thought, and justly so, you're going to turn off the zombie people with all this Jane Austen you're leaving in, and you're going to turn off the Jane Austen with all these zombies you're putting in. So you're going to be left with a book that literally has no audience whatsoever. You know, um, And we thought they were probably right, but we wanted to do it anyway. And we thought, you know what? Just like all of my other four books previous, you know, maybe we'll break even on it. Um, and none of the four books I'd written with Jason up to that point had uh, cracked 3,000 on Amazon sales rank ever and had sold more than 12,000 or 13,000 copies total. Um, and we thought, well, this will be the same thing. You know, we'll, we'll sell 11,000 copies or 12,000 copies, we'll break even and uh, go on to the next book. And what happened, I guess, was sometime back in February or maybe late January, some industrious blogger out there um, stumbled upon it in an online catalog or something and looked at that, the cover, you know, this cover was like this, the, still the star of the show, you know, this cover designed by a guy named Doogie Horner in Philadelphia, um, looked at this, saw the title, and had that same reaction that I had, which was, you know, this is brilliant. I mean, whether or not it's brilliant, it's up for the reader to decide. But like, it's just one of those things. The cover plus the title has grabbed a ton of people's attention. And it's sort of propagated through the blogosphere. And then the mainstream media picked up on it. And then there was a piece in the Sunday Times of London a few months ago that said, you know, Hollywood bidding war, which I don't know, they completely fabricated. Um, and then other people said, well, we got to get on that action. And you know, um, it just became. Uh, I don't know. It just it became what it is. It started shooting up, and then uh, Entertainment Weekly reviewed it and gave it a really good review. And um, you know, then some other uh, outlets picked it up, and, and all of a sudden, you know, we were number nine on Amazon. We were, you know, next week we'll be we open at number three on the on the New York Times list. Last week we were number five. Next week we'll be number four. I mean, so it's crazy, you know, and uh, and. Like, we, like I said, we expected to sell 11,000 of these uh, and break even or whatever our break even number was, and we would have been thrilled. And as of a month after our publication date, there are 202,000 copies in print. So, you know, this is for me an absolutely out of body experience. You know, the fact that I'm even here uh, in Google headquarters in Santa Monica talking to three offices, you know, at the same time. And it, you know, it's just a, a total weird. You know, I don't know. Hi, everybody in the other offices. Um, hello. Uh, it, it, it's 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 completely uh, uh, exciting and and humbling and mind numbing and awesome and scary and you know all of those things. And um, so, with that, what I want to do that's sort of the genesis of the book. So that's you know that's how the book came to be. But uh, but I, I'm going to read an excerpt and then. Uh, and then hopefully people will have some questions, uh, or I can ramble on some more while you think of questions. And then, uh, and then I'll read some more as we go along here. But um, well, I'll start with uh, I'll start with one of Elizabeth's first uh, Elizabeth Bennett's first encounters uh, with what uh, what what they call unmentionables in the book. They don't refer to them uh, in mixed company as zombies because zombies is kind of a curse word. 
uh, you know, the people in the Regency period, one of the things about Jane Austen's books and all of the Regency books is people never really say what they mean. You know, there's a euphemism for everything. Uh, and politeness is absolutely paramount. So, uh, so I thought it would be funny if, if that applied to zombies as well. Anyway. There was suddenly a terrible shriek, not unlike that which hogs make while being butchered. Elizabeth knew at once what it was and reached for her ankle dagger most expeditiously. She turned, blade at the ready, and was met with the regrettable visage of three unmentionables, their arms outstretched and mouths agape. The closest seemed freshly dead, his burial suit not yet discolored, his eyes not yet dust. He lumbered toward Elizabeth at an impressive pace, and when he was but an arm's length from her, she plunged the dagger into his chest and pulled it skyward. The blade continued upward, cutting through his neck and face until it burst through the very top of his skull. He fell to the ground and was still. The second unmentionable was a lady, and much longer dead than her companion. She rushed at Elizabeth, her clawed fingers swaying clumsily about. Elizabeth lifted her skirt, disregarding modesty, and delivered a swift kick to the creature's head, which exploded in a cloud of brittle skin and bone. She too fell and was no more. The third was unusually tall, and though long dead, still possessed a great deal of strength and quickness. Elizabeth had not yet recovered from her kick when the creature seized her arm and forced the dagger from it. She pulled free before he, get, he could get his teeth on her and took the crane position, which she thought appropriate for an opponent of such height. The creature advanced, and Elizabeth landed a devastating chop across its thighs. The limbs broke off, and the unmentionable fell to the ground, helpless. She retrieved her dagger and beheaded the last of her opponents, lifting its head by the hair and letting her battle cry be known for a mile in every direction. So, pretty much the same as the original. Um, uh, that just, that, that's a little, uh, that's an example of what, what seemed like so much fun for me when I, you know, when I first heard about the idea. Uh, when, when we first started talking about uh, doing this book and actually really writing this book instead of, you know, just talking about writing it. It was how much fun it would be uh, to write these ridiculous, gratuitous, gory, sort of modern scenes, but to do it in the mimicked language of Jane Austen. Um, that was the biggest challenge, the language, uh, you know, and that's also to me what's the funniest about the book is the contrast. There's so much contrast in the book. Zombies are a 20th century phenomenon. They're not like vampires or werewolves. So they're unexpected in 1813 England, you know, in a way that I think a vampire or werewolf wouldn't be. Um, and uh, just as ninjas don't belong in 1813 England, but they're in this book. Uh, just as gore fests don't belong in Jane Austen, but you know. So it's all these contrasts, and it's the contrast between the language and the, and the subject matter that's the funniest and the most fun for me. Anyway, somebody throw me a line. With with uh, with a question and yes. Uh, so you, you mentioned you went back to Pride and Prejudice and, and really kind of reread it and researched it all. And did you already have kind of the corpus of knowledge of like zombie flick and horror movies, or did you have to go out and research that as well? Yeah, I mean the question was I don't know if these guys could hear it, but the question was did I have the zombie knowledge built in uh, before I did the book? The answer is yes, happily. Uh, you know Jane Austen, I had to I had to research thoroughly and and I had to you know, study and restudy the language to try to mimic it as best I could. Um, but zombies are, you know, part of my DNA. Um, I wrote a book called How to Survive a Horror Movie a couple of years ago, and it was sort of born of, you know, my lifelong love for the horror genre. And, um, you know, movies in particular, but also books. You know, when I was a kid, I was one of those 11-year-old kids who was, you know, watching uh, uh, cheap horror movies on USA Up All Night. and. And, uh, and reading Stephen King books you know, by the handful and things like that. I was just obsessed with that genre. And so for me, the zombies that I grew up loving were the George Romero zombies of you know, the 60s and 70s. And you know, they're Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead. Those were, those were some of my favorite movies, still are some, some of my favorite movies. So those were the, the model. That was the model that I used for the zombies in this book. You know? uh, sometimes I get asked, you know, why didn't you do like the 28 Days Later uh, Danny Boyle modern zombies. Well, the best answer I have is because they're not funny. They're, you know, they're scary. I mean, I like my zombies slow and stupid. Uh, and to me, the more, uh, to, to me, the, 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 you know, the more hapless they are, the funnier they are. And, you know, there are scenes in this book um, where, you know, they'll be riding by on a road and they'll see a couple of unmentionables on their hands and knees in a garden uh, biting into heads of cauliflower because they've mistaken them for brains, you know? And, 
I mean, that's ridiculous, and you know, but that's the whole point of the book. I mean, uh, which kind of leads me to a larger point of, you know, this book does not take itself seriously. And I think that if, if it did, it would be a huge mistake. You know, I think that um, the people who sort of get up in arms, there are a few of them about, you know, this is sacrilege, how dare you? You know, why would you ruin a perfectly uh, perfect piece of literature? Um, well, it was never my intention to replace Pride and Prejudice. It's, you know, and, and what, what is, I got a question, I was on a, a radio show and I got a question, someone called in and just said, why? Why would you do this? What is the point to this? And I said, if you can find a point to this book, you are a thousand times smarter than me because to me the point is, it's funny. And it was fun to do. And, you know, apparently a lot of people think so as well, you know. So, um, so I'm not, you know, and, and I, I'm also doing it from a standpoint of reverence for Jane Austen rather than this is not me getting back at Jane Austen for anything. This is not me saying, oh, you know, to hell with Jane Austen. Jane Austen's stupid. No, Jane Austen's amazing. But at the same time, I don't think that this detracts from Jane Austen's greatness in any way, shape, or form. I don't, I don't think that you could. I don't think that anything that I could do to this book would detract from the, you know, the towering brilliance of the original. So um, I'm just saying that to cut off any any attempts to, you know, because some of you look at me like, you know, oh, I got a question for you, man, and I'm going to... Yes, in the back. Oh, wait, we're waiting for the question microphone to get over there so we can all hear it. So actually, my question kind of is about, uh, I guess, Jane Austen in a sense. Um, what do you think uh, her, what do you think she would have thought of uh, this kind of, of the, a mashup and of, you know, essentially sort of, you know, someone doing a parodic uh, sort of uh, taking liberties with. I mean, we'll never written. know, but I like to think, and mainly because it just helps me sleep at night. <laughs> I like to think that she would, uh, she would, she would laugh. And the reason for that is be because the more I learned about Jane Austen, the more I read Jane Austen, the more I realized Jane Austen was an irreverent person. Um, she lived in this very prim, proper, and polite society, uh, and she called it out for what it was. She called out the people around her for being hypocrites, you know, and she called out some of the people around her for being misogynistic. Um, so I think she's a sharp-witted, incredibly insightful person, and I think that, uh, I think that she can also be a little uh, mean-spirited at times and, and, and a little uh, deviant, you know, in some of the things that she writes. So, you know, this while not mean-spirited, is certainly deviant and certainly silly. Um, and uh, I, th I hope, anyway, that she would see it for that. So, how yes, do you, sir. How do you think the style of Anne Zombies, you know, your bits hold up to uh, Jane Austen's style? Well, and I'd love to read the diff just on its own. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, what's funny is there are places where I think I succeed in the book and places where I don't succeed. Um, a couple of times, you know, I've reread it and, you know, things jump out at me. But then again, I know that they're there. Uh, you know, you can't ever really truly mimic that style of writing successfully. I'm not going to sit here and tell anybody that, you know, even on my best day, I can mimic, you know, the, the writing of Jane Austen. But I do think I get close. And, you know, I do think that I do think that I get close enough so that it's not jarring. When you read it, you know, I think, you know, I worked very hard to make this sort of microsurgery process. You know, I didn't just want to drop in these chunks. Uh, I, you know, there are things, uh, every page, there is a word, a line, a paragraph, you know, um, there is some reordering of sentences so things, you know, flow a little differently. Um, I, I tried, that was, that was the greatest challenge of this book and the greatest fun of it. Um, so, so I don't think that my writing in any way measures up. Um, but I think from a standpoint of, of mimicry, uh, I think that most people, uh, when they read the book, yeah, I mean, that's true, that's fair. Most people say, you know, um, the biggest surprise that they had was that it seemed to make, it seemed right. It made sense, you know, it didn't, it didn't take me out of it. I, I would read these passages. A lot of people tell me, you know, I'm sitting here reading these passages and it, I have to stop myself and say, wait, this is ridiculous. Jane Austen, you know, zombie, th these people aren't fighting zombies, what am, you know? Um, so, and when I hear that, that's, you know, that's, for me, that's the greatest compliment is that, you know, you've been able to at least mi uh, mimic Jane Austen to the point where it's not so horrible that it doesn't take us out of the, 
you know. Yes? How much do you think your writing style has changed? Um, my writing style, the question is how much has my writing style changed? I think my writing style it changes from book to book, you know, because every book I do, I'm learning something. Uh, everything I write, whether it's for TV or film or books, you know, I, I think that if you're the, I think that as a writer, if you look back at something five years ago that you wrote and you don't hate it, you're in a lot of trouble <laughs> because it means that you've stopped growing, you know, and I hate everything that I wrote a year ago uh, and certainly five years ago and, you know, so, um, so, so my writing style has, uh, yeah, I don't know. It has changed a lot, but I, I, specifically because of this book, I mean, this was the first real solid chunk of fiction writing that I did, even though it was taking something that already existed and sort of weaving something new into it. Um, so this was, from a, from a standpoint of writing a fiction book, this was, you know, this was a, an introductory course. So I can only hope it gets better. Um, yes, sir. Well, actually, I actually have two questions. One is, proportion-wise, how much of the original Jane Austen text, story, et cetera, is in the, in like, how much of the book is Jane Austen and how much of it is you? 85-15. It's 85% Pride and Prejudice. Um, and, you know, 15%, uh, roughly 25,000 words of new stuff broken up, you know, spread out over 300 pages. So sometimes that'll be, you know, people say, wow, that's a lot of Jane Austen, you know, but I think that... <laughs> I didn't want to write the modern version of Pride and Prejudice. I didn't want to like, you know, start from page one. And I don't think that's the point of this exercise. The point is to try to weave something into an existing book and mash it up, you know. Um, you know so yeah, about 85% is the original book. And 15% is woven through. But at the same time, that could be three or four words on one page. Um, 600 words on the next page of solid stuff that never existed, a, a sequence or something. Um, sometimes there are two, three pages at a time that never existed solidly in the book. And then mostly there's paragraphs, new sentences, word changes everywhere, just so things you know, stay consistent. And uh, you said that you've come across a handful of Austin lovers who took offense at the book. Have you found the opposite, people who like the, like the original and also really like what you did with it? Well, I think that's... The, this is the biggest surprise to me in terms of the success of the book is that the, you know, the Janeites, the, uh, the Austin lovers, you know, the self-proclaimed, I mean, they, uh, they have by and large embraced this, uh, which is a huge shock to me because I thought, uh, you know, I thought I was going to be burned in effigy for this. And some people have, you know, and, uh, but, but the thing is, they're the, the, the minority, and it's strange, you know, like I've had, I've gotten letters from Austin professors and scholars and, you know, people who want to teach this book alongside uh, the original Pride and Prejudice, <laughs> which is weird, we'll get to that, it's totally weird, you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, uh, they seem to have a sense of humor about it, they seem to see it for what it is, which is a way for them to experience a book they've experienced time and time again, um, in a new way, and just in a sort of light-hearted way, you know, whatever you want to call it. But um, they also, and this is, this is another cool thing, um, I know for a fact that there are people who have read this book, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, who have never dared go near a Jane Austen book, and read this book and said, not only said that I want to now go back and read the original, but I want to go back and read, you know, Sense and Sensibility. Um, or Mansfield Park, or you know, Persuasion, or you know, I mean, I'm not saying that's the majority of people, but there are some people who are finding Jane Austen through this book, and as weird as that sounds, it's pretty awesome, you know, because if you can get people to read anything nowadays, other than like Us Weekly, I mean, it's like I see it as a victory, and especially if you can get them to read any version of a classic that may, you know, lo and behold, introduce them to other classics then, you know, I'm not saying that was my intent. I did not go into this, like, with the noble intent to, you know, bolster people's reading habits or anything, but it's a, it's a happy side effect as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, yes, there are a few people, I call them the how dare you, sir, crowd, who dismiss this book completely out of hand, will not read it, will not even look at it, you know, and already think that I'm the worst thing that ever happened to the printed word, which is flattering in a way. So, um, yes? Um, you're talking about how 
when this came to you, you just thought this is incredible and you were inspired for this one thing. Do you think this is going to turn into a series of updating of classic books with modern elements or is this a one-off thing? This is definitely going to be a series of updating and, and, and I'll say I will have nothing to do with it. Um, I, uh, I, it would be very easy for me to now, with the success of this book, say, all right, sense and sensibility and, oh, I don't know, monkeys, you know, or, uh, or uh, Wuthering Heights Reloaded or, you know, War and Peace and More War, you know, it's, you know, it's like those opportunities are out there and people have wanted me to write these, these books and I think it's very easy to allow yourself to get boxed into doing one thing. Um, you know, I, I do have an opportunity now to do more books in, the, in fiction, and uh, so, uh, so I've chosen to go a slightly different route. I'm doing a book right now called Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. So take a minute, let that soak in. <laughs> All right, it's, yes. So, so in a way, it's, it's, it's not based on an existing book, but I am remixing an actual life, you know, and sort of trying to explain real historical events from a different way and explain a really fascinating life and make it that much more fascinating and, and fictionalized. And it's going to be sort of in the style of, you know, a David McCullough biography or, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to read like that. Now, again, you know, aim high. David McCullough, try to, you know, mimic that style of writing. You know, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Walter Isaacson, you know. Those are all the guys that I read. Those are my literary heroes. I mean, I, I you know, I've moved on from the 11-year-old kid, uh, you know, uh, absorbing every Stephen King book he could get on to, you know, the 33-year-old guy who reads every single uh, presidential biography and historical, you know, novel that he can get his hands on. So, so for me, it's, uh, it's exciting to get to do this genre now. And I mean, again, it's not that much different in a way. It's, it's, it is a remix of, in, a, in a sense, but it's not, uh, it's, it's going to be from page one, you know, completely written by me. So, uh, yeah. Does anybody at the, uh, the other, can they ask questions at the other offices? Yeah, any questions on the VC? Okay, great. Well, anyway. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Awesome. Right. Um, you know, strangely enough, I, I love horror and I love, uh, I love horror movies, but, you know, I've, I've become like a biography guy for some reason. For some reason, uh, I almost exclusively read nonfiction right now. So, uh, so the two books that I'm waiting to, that are literally on my night table, uh, are uh, David McCullough's Truman which is like 9,000 pages long, and I don't know when I'm ever going to get to read that, but, you know, because I also have, I have a six-month-old baby at home, so that's, you know, add that to TV day job to, uh, you know, having lunch at Google, and, you know, it's, <laughs> it's hard to read a thousand-page biography, but that, and then uh, the Jefferson, uh, no, 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 sorry, no, the, uh, the Jackson uh, biography, the new Jackson biography, American Lion, um, which I, I picked up but haven't read yet. I'm trying to think if there's, Anything uh, fiction that, um, but it's yeah, it's weird. Like I, I, I've just fiction's kind of trickled out for me in the last uh, couple of years. But I'll probably get back on a big fiction kick right now. But I'm glad you have How to Survive a Horror Movie in your to be read pile because it's. I've been told it's it's the world's uh, funniest bathroom book. So I don't know if that's <laughs> a compliment or not. But uh, you know, um, but yeah. Anybody in here? Oh, we have one question in here. Um, even though you're kind of just starting on your, your fiction career, how would you rate difficulty or amount of work, um, say, writing one topic versus mashing up two or more? Like, is it significantly more difficult, like twice as much research or...? Yeah, well, actually, this is, uh, this is one thing I wanted to talk about in terms of research was, uh, um, since we're here at Google, uh, Google not only for the Abraham Lincoln book I'm writing right now, but for Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, was like my co-author, basically. Because, you know, there are things that I would find myself Googling all throughout the day, seriously, like, okay, not only, first of all, I looked up the original manuscript and different versions 
through Google, you know, and uh, would flip through and see, you know, what some of the different versions of the manuscript look like. But, uh, but the coolest thing was, all right, so it's 1813, and you know, you're putting muskets now in the hands of these girls, and you're putting all sorts of swords and all sorts of kung fu fighting styles and everything. Well, I have no idea what any of that stuff really is. And I don't know what kind of musket they would use in 1813. Well, it turns out that in England, uh, if you had a little bit of money, you would use a brown bess, you know, and uh, okay, so great. So what does a brown bess look like? So you Google brown bess, and all of a sudden there's all these antique uh, uh, shops offering actual, you know, refurbished brown besses, and uh, you look and you see what kind of flint it has and what kind of, you know, thing it has, and, you know, you learn what all the names of those things are. Um, what does a katana sword look like? What do tabi boots look like? What, you know, what do throwing stars look like? What are another name for throwing stars that they would actually use to refer to them since they're actually training? Um, so it's all that stuff. And, and, you know, and it's also uh, those frequent visits to uh, thesaurus.com. Uh, you know, because, man, I mean, there, you do not, uh, you don't, and never in this book will you use one word when, you know, eight would suffice. I mean, you know, the, the way that people describe things is wonderful, but it's very, uh, it's very wordy and, uh, you know, and the language is obviously very different. So, I mean, Google was uh, a huge help. And now with the Abraham Lincoln book, I mean, forget it. I mean, you know, if I want to see an actual picture of Mary Surratt's boarding house that John Wilkes Booth went to before he shot Lincoln, there's the picture and I can take a virtual tour. Oh, and you know, there's, uh, there's the actual, uh, uh, pistol that he used to kill Lincoln, and what does the engraving look like, and you know, what are the, what's the, how many sites, I can't think of how many sites have actual timelines of Lincoln's last hours down to the minute. And so when you're writing something like that, I mean, the window is always open, and, uh, and I'm constantly Googling to make sure I'm getting things right, so. Yes? Uh, are we going to see this on the big screen, and what kind of style do you envision it, like historical drama, or straight horror, or satire? I, you know, I hope we'll see it on the big screen. You know, some, some uh, secret nebulous, uh, does not wish to be named at this time entity has optioned it as a movie, which is strange. I don't know why they don't want to be named, but they don't. And, uh, but however, I'm extremely excited, you know, knowing the people that are involved in the potential movie version of this. Um, they're awesome people, and I'm really excited for it. And I hope, you know, that maybe in a few years, a couple years, we'll see this, uh, you know, at the Cineplex, uh, uh, right along with uh, uh, Abe Lincoln Vampire Hunter or something. But, um, but uh, the, the style I always saw when I was writing this was a mix between, you know, the six-part BBC miniseries of Pride and Prejudice, which is, you know, extraordinarily well done and much better, I'm sorry to say, than the Keira Knightley version. But, uh, yes, thank you. Good. A little street cred. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but uh, I always saw the, the, the mix of that style, the very staid, sort of very well acted, very, you know, reserved version. And then all of a sudden, it's the Matrix, you know, and Elizabeth is flipping through the air in slow motion and cutting off heads, you know, as she goes around with her katana sword and things. And, you know, um, now whether or not that'll work, I mean, who knows, but that's, that's just how I saw it. And, uh, and I think that uh, given the people that they're talking about actually making this movie, I mean, that probably will, probably will end up being the style of the movie, if it ever happens. So, anybody have a, oh, we have a question in the back. Um, I was just wondering, since it's 85% Jane Austen and 15% you, were there any kind of legal issues or copyright issues? How did you go about dealing with that? Right, um, the, the main, uh, well, one of the main reasons we picked Pride and Prejudice is because it's in the public domain. Um, it was written in uh, 1813, and so there are no applicable copyright laws in terms of the original book. And then sometimes you'll run into trouble with people's estates, um, but in Jane Austen's case, she doesn't have any heirs uh, that control any of the rights to any of her things. So this is about as free and clear, legally speaking, as you could get. Um, you know, uh, I think that you would probably, I don't know, I mean, People are going to want to do this to. They're going to want to do this treatment to uh, to Mark Twain. They're going to want to do this treatment to the Brontes. And they're, you know, I don't know what kind of legal trouble they'll they'll run into with that. And you know, I wish them luck. But but in terms of Pride and Prejudice, we were we were in the clear. Um, all right. Well, this is a good opportunity to read one more thing. I had all these things picked out, but you know what? I will not. I will not sit here and just read, read, read. Um, let's do the last one. 
This is when, um, you know, in the original book, Lady Catherine de Bourgh is uh, um, Mr. Darcy's aunt, and she's this grand old Judy Dench looking, you know, uh, dame who, uh, who uh, in this version is the greatest of all zombie slayers. You know, the, the conceit here is that England has been under this unmentionable menace from the strange plague for about 50 years. And one of the jokes is that they haven't left. I mean, they've just kind of accepted in this very, you know, English stiff upper lip way that <laughs> this is just how it is in England now and we're going to deal with this and, you know, we'll just instead of sending our, our wealthy children off to, uh, to the universities in France or Spain, we're going to send them off to Kyoto and Shaolin so that they can you know, hold their own against the zombie menace. So that's, uh, and Lady Catherine de Bourgh is, uh, besides being extraordinarily wealthy and you know, extraordinarily powerful, is also uh, the most accomplished slayer of, uh, of the undead England has ever known, even though she's now in her 80s. And, uh, has to supplement her powers by surrounding herself with a cadre of ninjas. <coughs> anyway, I will not be interrupted. Hear me in silence. My daughter and my nephew are formed for each other. Their fortune on both sides is splendid. They are destined for each other by the voice of every member of their respective houses. And what is to divide them? The upstart pretensions of a young woman whose sister was lately concerned in a scandalous elopement with the son of the elder Darcy's with the son of the elder Darcy's musket polisher? <sighs> Long sentence. A woman without family, connections, or fortune? Your daughter's fortune is indeed splendid, said Elizabeth. But pray tell, what other qualities does she possess? Is she fetching? Is she trained in the deadly arts? Has she even strength enough to lift a katana? How dare you? Tell me once and for all, are you engaged to him? Though Elizabeth would not, for the mere purpose of obliging Lady Catherine, have answered this question, she could but say, after a moment's deliberation, I am not. Lady Catherine seemed pleased. And will you promise me never to enter into such an engagement? I would sooner die than see my honor so defiled. Then, Miss Bennet, said Lady Catherine, setting down her parasol and removing her coat, die you shall. Upon this, she set her feet for combat. Do you mean to challenge me to a duel in my family dojo? I mean only to rid the world of an insolent little girl and, pre and preserve the dignity of a superior man, lest Pemberley be forever polluted by your stench. If that be the case, said Elizabeth, dropping her parasol, then let this be our first and final battle. She set her feet in return. The two ladies, separated by more than 50 years, yet hardly at all in abilities, remained thus for a moment, until Lady Catherine, her plan of attack fully formed, leapt skyward with the strength quite striking for a woman her, of her advanced age. She flipped through the air over Elizabeth's head and landed a blow on the top of her skull, the force of which brought the younger to her knees. Had Elizabeth been anything less than perfectly fit, the blow would have most assuredly splintered her spine. We'll leave it there, because I don't want to ruin, <laughs> I don't want to ruin the end and, you know, who wins the fight? Okay, it's Elizabeth. <laughs> um, so, you know, the book is silly and it's over the top, but the point of it was to take the original characters and the original themes of the original book and give them an absurd scope, you know, to, uh, to make them, you know, in a way a little more modernized and, and, uh, and gory and bloody and silly. So, you know, um, that was the intention. Uh, some people think it works, some people think it, do it doesn't, but uh, anyway, does anyone have any more questions? Yes, sir. Oh, we're waiting for the microphone to cross the. Uh... <laughs> Almost there. Um, how much better of a reading experience do you think this is if you've read the original? I, I don't know if it's a better reading experience. It's a different reading experience. You know, I mean, it's. Uh, I think that if you like the original, um, if if. Uh, if you're a fan of Jane Austen and you know you like the rhythms of Jane Austen, you like the language, and you happen to like blood and gore and zombies, then you know this is the book for you, man. But uh, but uh, no, I mean, you know, I that's the thing. I don't I don't want to ever get into the whole better situation, you know, because then I get in trouble with people, and you know, I mean, it, it's it's certainly bloodier, it's certainly gorier, it's certainly scarier. And it's certainly sillier than the original. 
And if you like those things, you know, and, and you're down for a, a good old uh, rollicking laugh or two, then yeah. I guess I mean that if you haven't read the original, are you not going to get this? Like, um, are there things you're going to miss? No, no. It's all, it's all there. I mean, the themes are still there. The characters are still who they were. They've just been, you know, their, their, their attitudes have sort of been given steroids, you know, like instead of, uh, instead of the arrogant, um, proud Mr. Darcy, it's the arrogant, proud Mr. Darcy, the, the, the uh, zombie slayer, you know, um, who, who doesn't think less of Elizabeth because she has less money, but thinks less of Elizabeth because A, she has less money, and B, she was trained by those filthy Chinese peasants in Shaolin where only the poorest families send their their, uh, their girls to be trained, um, you know, he, whereas he was trained in the, you know, the, the dojos of Kyoto where all the proper Englishmen are trained, you know. So, I mean, it's, all the class differences are still there, all the character interactions are still there. I, I mean, a couple people suffer slightly different fates in this book, you know, one of them, there is a main character who slowly throughout the course of the book becomes a zombie. Um, obviously that did not happen in the original, but, uh, but, uh, but then again, you know, it's been pointed out to me since by, again, people smarter than me that the characters in Jane Austen's original book are kind of like zombies in a way, you know, if you think about it, because they sort of go about their lives with a single-minded purpose. No matter what's happening around them, all they care about is wealth, status, privilege, gossip, and, you know, who's dating who and who's got the best kind of lamb for supper and things. You get the sense in her original books that the countryside could have been burning to the ground around them and they would still be concerned with, you know, is my dress beautiful, you know, or whatever. And the only thing I've really done in a broad sense is set the country on fire around them and yet they still care about this crap, this trivial crap. And that to me is funny and it makes the original contrast that much, you know, more severe. So, so I think that if you, if you haven't read uh, Pride and Prejudice, I think that you'll get the same sort of thematic experience in a way and you'll get you get to know these characters uh, in a in some sense um, I, I would suggest you go back and read the original after um, and you know make your own judgments but I guess you know yeah I'm not going to steer you wrong <laughs> any more questions any more questions from the uh, home office and uh... did you really manage to get a pony out of this ah I, uh, yeah, I made up a, uh, a, a thing on Facebook that if we, if we broke uh, 100, I think, on, on Amazon's rank, that Quirk Books was going to buy me a, a, one of those miniature ponies, uh, and I was going to name him Fitzwilliam. Uh, but sadly, this was only a joke. I did not actually get a pony out of this. Yeah. So I actually did, but then I had to, uh, I had to put him down. I realized we couldn't have him in our apartment. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There's some people about to burst into tears in here. This was just a joke. I didn't know. Um, well, if you guys have any more questions out there, let me know. Otherwise, I want to uh, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day, and it's good having lunch with you, and it's great talking to you, and I really appreciate the invite. So, cheers to you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>